Let's turn tonight to Psalm 27. It's a great psalm. I was a little late tonight because I was trying to get the last things worked out, but it's just so cool. Psalm 27, four little simple parts tonight. Sometimes it's the best way to remember. But David teaches us how to go to war. And I don't know if you know this, but all the way through the Psalms, it's about David in warfare. There were three areas of David's life that we come to know. The first was David was that sweet psalmist. When he was young, he would play, you know, and, and sing and worship. He was able to take out a bear. He was able to take out a lion. So Goliath was nothing, but it was just him and God. He no doubt laid down and looked up and saw the stars. And so he said, what is, my, what is thou that's mindful of him, the son of man that thou hast visited him? What is man that God that you have decided to come inside him? I think the angels have always had a problem. Because the angels know that simply just a shout from heaven can bring salvation. But for some incredible reason, God has chosen to use people. <laughs> It's just the most amazing thing. Why would you choose failures when you know they're going to fail? And why would you use people when you know they're going to get puffed up? It's the most amazing thing. Everything else in creation is perfect. I mean, the birds and the bees and, you know, you got the bees, you got the ants that chew, you got the ants that spit, you got the ants that, you know, destroy, you got the ants, you got everything's in perfect harmony. I mean, a beehive is in one degree, one degree. So you have, you know, the air-conditioned bees, and you have the heater bees. Some of you are heater bees, you know. What do you mean? Well, when it gets real cold, some of the bees just start eating a little bit more. The heat from their body begins to warm up the hive. If it gets too many guys eating in there, then the air-conditioned bees begin to fan, and they cool it down. That's true. Then you got the dancer bees, you know. They dance. That's why when you walk down the street or you walk in your backyard, you see one little bee right here. You ever wonder what happened? He wasn't paying attention. Because that, the, as that one bee began to you know, dance, and he did two jiggers this way and two this way and two this way, the second one meant to hang, hang a left at the third street. But because he was checking out this other bee, this cute bee, he didn't see, turn left. He thought, go straight. And he ran out of honey because the last thing the bee does is it does a certain move that tells you how much pollen or how much you have to eat. So when you get there, you are bone dry. So if you really love that bee, give it a little bit of honey and he'll make his way. But, you know, everything's in perfect harmony with God except man. And yet it shows us the marvelous grace of God. Well, in Psalm 27, many of you have read it, but David is teaching how to go to war. He says here in verses 1 through 3, he says, you must fight my battles, God. And he says in verse 1, you are my strength. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so if you're going to have to go to battle, then in the day that it becomes dark. Who was it, you remember, that prayed and God stopped the sun so he could win the war? It was Joshua. He prayed, and all of a sudden the sun stopped. And he was able to defeat the enemy. And it goes on to say, You are my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You are the strength of my life. Who should I be afraid? So there are moments of Tremendous agony and pain because we don't understand why God is the cancer. Why is this thing happening in my life? Well, cancer is always smell of the small C, and Christ is the capital C, so God's able to overcome it. And God's able to do whatever he needs to. And so we see here, you are my strength. But in verse 2 and 3, God, you are my confidence. So people that say, God, you are the strength of my life, I don't see the confidence in their life. It's easy to say you're my strength, but where's the evidence of it? You worry, you fret, you're afraid, you are going crazy, you're uptight, you're getting mad. 
I thought you said you trusted God. Well, I do. Well, where's the evidence of it? We are to trust God with all of our hearts. We're not to lean to our own understanding. In all thy ways, we are to acknowledge him because he's the God of our life. So God is going to take you through some difficult times. But the Bible says that when you pass through the fire, I'll be there. And when you pass through the water, I'll be there. And when all of a sudden you feel like you're drowning, I'll be there. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. At any time, any moment, you can cry out to me. And the confidence he's talking about in verse 2 and 3 is pretty profound. When the wicked, even my enemy and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. They couldn't get there. I have to go back to what I said today. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a silly little thing. But I'll tell you what. It's given me such great faith. It was just what that president says, you know, how do you deal with all your problems? And the president says, well, I had 10 major problems. And as I was looking at these major problems, as they were coming towards me, nine fell off a cliff. And by the time the 10th one got to me, he was so tired and weak, I could whip him by myself. Boy, I like that. You know, I really do like that, honestly. I mean, I have quoted that probably 100 times so far in two days. Because it has ministered to my heart in such a way that we worry about things. We have become people that almost fulfill a prophecy. We're so worried about everything. And then we realize in verse 2, though a host should encamp against me, the 185,000 Assyrians camped around Hezekiah, and they all died by the angel of the Lord. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, and this will I be confident, what? That God will fight my battles. So if it's just a little tiny fight, God, you will be the light of my heart. If it is a major battle and a nation goes to war, then you are my confidence. doesn't make a difference. If I have to fight in the hill, then so be it. You are the God of the hill. If I have to fight in the valley, then so be it. You are the God of the valley. It was Ahab that said, oh, you know, um, ben had that, I should say, that said, oh, he's only the God of the hills. And so God says, you know, because he said that, we're going to whip him in the valley. Well, the valley is a dangerous place because you can't hide anywhere. At least in the hills, you have the upper advantage of caves and rocks and so on. But in the valley, you would have to take on the chariots. And that's a frightening thing. But God said, don't worry about it. I will be your confidence. They're never going to reach you. Nine chariots will go over, and the time the horse gets to the you, you're going to be a whip him and the horse and everybody by yourself. And so we see that David teaches us to go to war. You go to war. Why? Well, I'm so afraid. No, you go to war. I, just, I can't do it. You have to take up battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness. So you can't set in darkness. You can't set in depression. You can't set in discouragement any longer. You have to rise and take it, and whatever happens, happens. But God help you that you're not going to set and feel sorry for yourself. The four leopards were sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, and finally one says, we're tired. <laughs> we're going to go see what we can find. And the other three got all weird. And the one got up and says, you know, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die starving. And so he got up, and by the time he got there, the enemy was destroyed, and they had a feast. So you see, a lot of times we worry and got, get so weird. So if you're going to fight, get it out. If you're going to be upset with your wife and she's upset with you, go home and ask her, what's wrong? It was going to cause a, it, you know something, it's going to cause a fight one way or the other. You know, and, and this is what you have to understand. This is so important in your life that it's going to be a war. And let me tell you, a very simple way to look at life, and you're going to change your whole heart. If you decide to stay on this side of the promised land, I don't want to go into the promised land because there's too many wars. Well, just look at it this way. If you stay out, then here's what's going to happen. You're going to be attacked first. Like Gad and Manasseh, they were attacked first. Secondly, they went from raising cows to raising pigs to kicking Jesus out, the Gadareans. If you decide to go in, it's going to be a war. One king, five kings, 31 kings, either way. Now, 
when you have come to agree it's a war either way you go, then let me ask you the question. If you have to fight here or you have to fight here, would you rather fight in God's will or would you rather fight outside God's will? See, the decision's been made. Well, I was not going to go in because I don't want to fight, but if I'm going to have to fight here, well, not only are you going to have to fight the war, you've got to fight God because you're out of God's will. So let's just surrender to God. I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to deal with it. I'm not going to overcome. I'm going to find out. And you're going to find out it's not as bad as you thought. The moment you rise up, God is going to be with you. God's going to soften the heart, and God's going to give you victory. Number two, David said in verse 4 through 6, David teaches us how to worship. Not only how to war, but how to worship. And this is interesting to me. Without worship, there's never going to be a victory in war, ever. Without a heart of worship, you're never going to win a battle in your whole life. And so he says the battles are won in worship. And so if you're going through it, you're worried, you're overwhelmed, you're breaking out with pimples, everything else, it's time to worship. Just let your heart go. Because in that resurrection of your spirit and life, then God is going to fight the battle like Jehoshaphat did. And so the battles are won in worship. And he says here in verse 4, Behold his beauty. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and check it out, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So you see what David is doing. He's showing us that it's not that you're going to go to hell if you don't dwell with God, and that's how we think. God, I'm so afraid that if I don't do this, I'm going to get in tro so much trouble. Well, that's not looking at the beauty of God. That's just saying, God, I'm worshiping you. I hope you like it. No. What are you worshiping? I don't know, but I sure like it. Well, if you have come to worship tonight, wouldn't you think the object of our worship is Jesus Christ? It is. So isn't he beautiful? He is. And we ought to what? Adore him, applaud him, praise him, adoration, everything else that goes with it. So if I'm going to worship God, then the, the object of my worship is Jesus Christ. And the beauty of God is everything. Now, if I'm mad at God, I can't worship. Or if I feel like God has taken advantage of me, I can't worship. You see, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you understand if you're a worshiper or not. If your worship is based upon things going your way, you're never going to worship. That's why you come to church and do this. So let me ask you a question. Are you hurting the pastor? No. Are you hurting the person next to you? No. You're robbing him. But who are you hurting? You. Because you've just gone through another day without worshiping. And you now are folding your hands against the one who can help you. So by faith, lift up those feeble hands. By faith, begin to share the goodness of God. And you will find the victory goes to you every single time. So the battles are won. Behold his beauty. Verse 5, behold the tabernacle. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. So not only am I going to behold the beauty of the Lord, but secondly, I'm going to behold the tabernacle of the Lord. How gorgeous it really was. How beautiful it really was. And so now I'm looking at the things of the Spirit, not the things of the flesh. And sometimes I can worship and not look at God. Sometimes I come in here and just lip words, and yet my heart is not singing to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Kevin has taught as well that we need to come and we need to adore him. And when I, all of a sudden I'm singing but there's not, nothing going on, something's wrong. And that's what I need to focus on the beauty of God and the tabernacle of God. I'm going to heaven. And then notice in verse 6, he says the beauty again. How shall my head be lifted up? My enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle the sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises to the Lord. You know, when I lift my eyes, my head goes up. He is the lifter of my head. It's a cool thing just to worship God. So what do I do? I worship. How? I begin to trust God. That's what it is. It's I'm willing to, I don't want to sacrifice. Well, you have to sacrifice. You have to love people. I don't. Yes, you do. So what's the best way to come out of a trial? Worship. Well, Steve, I don't feel like it. Well, what did Habakkuk do? When God told him who was now going to come and destroy the children of Israel, it was Nebuchadnezzar, 
it about destroyed him. But at the very end, when God got done, it says in chapter 3 that he began to jump up, spin around, and begin to praise God. Though the barn was empty, though the fields were empty, though everything was devastated, nothing had changed, yet he had changed. So you see, worship is not getting a check and then worshiping. That's nice. That's celebrating. But worship is worshiping before the check comes because you know the check is coming, but because you believe in God. So if I worship in the check, I'm in trouble. If I worship in my God, I can worship 24-7. Amen? So that tells you why people worship and why they don't worship. Because they're basing their worship upon a thing, but not upon the Creator. So turn your worship to Jesus Christ. You have all the reasons in the world to worship Him. Number three, David teaches us how to walk daily. This is so cool. In verse 7 through 12, from the tabernacle we've been in, in verses 1 through 6, right? Been hanging out in the tabernacle, now to the marketplace. This is the most difficult. I've gone from just worshiping God in the tabernacle, seeing God, seeing His beauty, seeing everything, to now being in the marketplace. I see all the failure. I see man. It drives me crazy. And check it out. He says in verse 7, be honest. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me. Answer me. God, are you here? And here's what he's saying. God, are you here in the marketplace? God, I can't seem to hear you. There's so many cash registers going. There's so many people talking. There's so many carts banging. There's so many cars going on. Are you, there's so much fume happening. So many people looking. Are you here? Well, in the temple, he's here. Amen? He's here. But when you leave, he's gone. And he's with you. He's in your heart. So can you hear him the same as you hear him here? Here. It might be a blasting voice. My voice might just blast in the spirit. But can you hear the same spirit blasting at Home Depot or at, you know, Whole Foods? Or can you hear the whole thing happening there in the busyness of your life? You should be able to. So, but Steve, I don't. Then I want you to really try asking God to tune in to his voice at Home Depot. I don't care if you have to go down there. And just walk Home Depot until you hear God's voice. Do it. You keep walking. What are you doing here? I'm just walking. Why? I want to hear God's voice. Well, you can't hear God. I want that toy, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. As long as you want all those toys, you, can't, you won't hear God's voice. But when you get sick and tired of lusting after all the tools, and you know you can't afford it, amen? So you finally say, forget it. Then you can hear God's voice crystal clear. See, we get all tangled up, and so it's kind of cool. You can drive down Crenshaw and hear God's voice. Are you kidding me? No, you can do it. Because all of a sudden, you lose sight. There's a great movie called The Greatest Game. It's about a guy who was a caddy that becomes a golfer, wins the, the, the coat. But the thing that just touches my heart about the whole movie is that when he gets up ready to putt or ready to hit, all the things begin to fade away. The people are fading. Everything fades. And all he sees is one stick where the number is, where he's aiming, and his golf ball. That's it. He doesn't see people. And boy, I've watched that a hundred times, and that's what I want in my life. When I get ready to preach, I don't want to see this guy yawning, this guy falling asleep, and this guy, <laughs> and a fly land on his tongue. I don't want to see that. I want to see everything moved away, and all I see is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you can do it, but you have to practice. You have to discipline your heart. You have to say no to traffic and yes to God. You have to say no to getting mad at people cutting in and yes to the joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, and all of a sudden you're focusing. And so, number one, honesty. In verse 8, sensitivity. Check it out, verse 8. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said, oh God, I'll seek your face. Is that sensitivity? It sure is. If God says, I want you to stop, stop. You're going to head over to get a, you know, cappuccino. And you hear God say, you don't need that right now. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Listen. Don't fight. Listen. If all of a sudden you're going down the street and you hear something, stop. If you're in a store and you see somebody and God wants you to buy something for somebody, do it. Be sensitive to the Lord. And so he says in verse 8, seek my face. Hey, I'll seek your face, God. And then in verse 9 and 10, be faithful. He says in verse 9, hide not thy face far from me, put not thy spirit away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, 
O God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsook me, then the Lord will take me up. Now, that doesn't really apply to us because why? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. The Holy Spirit in David's day was not in him. It was on him. It was over him. Now we have the Spirit in our lives. And then in verse 11 and 12, he says this, Teach me, God, help me to be open in verse 11 and 12. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me. So underline in verse 11, teach me. Underline, lead me. And verse 12, underline, deliver me. This is so good. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path, because my enemy. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witness are rise up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. So God, in the marketplace, can you teach me? In the marketplace, can you lead me? In the marketplace, can I see your deliverance in my life? And lastly, before we have communion, David said, God, teach me what it is to wait. So God, teach me what it is to war. Help me not be afraid of warfare. Second, God, teach me how to worship. Teach me how to worship in such a way that I can be victorious in my battles. And third, God, teach me what it is to really come to a point in my life that I'm walking daily in the marketplace hearing your voice, being obedient and sensitivity, sensitive to the things of the Spirit. And lastly, David cries out, Lord, how to wait on you. Three things stand out to me. In verse 11, Lord, teach me your path. In other words, I can't really wait until I know God's will. He says, teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path. You see, if you're much encumbered, it's not good. It says you remember to take off all the weight you can if you're going to run the race and run with all your heart to cross that line before anybody else. So strip down as clean, as fast as you can run. So teach me, lead me the plain path. And then in verse 13, waiting takes tremendous hope. He said, I had fainted. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I don't know. I, I'm going to have to look it up, but, you know, I've told you before, there's the two rats, and they put the two rats in the water, and they both drown about five, I think it's six minutes, something like that. And then they did another experiment where they put the two rats in the water, and right before the one rat is going to go down, they pick them up, then they put them back in. And believe it or not, for the next 27 hours, he doesn't die. Why? He has hope. You see, when you lose hope, you might, you're going to die. When you get a little spark of hope, you can come out of depression. You can come out of discouragement. Just a little bit of hope can bring you so far. You cannot believe what the guys and the staff have done for me, the pastors by my side, how they have spoken hope to me, and it's given me just a brand new life. And so just a little bit of hope. I know I'm a rat, but still. <laughs> they pulled me out and put me back in, what can I say? But I'm still swimming. You know, and that's the whole thing is when you give somebody hope, that little hope can go a whole lifetime. And then lastly, waiting takes faith. Look at verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So Psalm 27, four little pegs in your life. One, it teaches you to go to war. Second, it teaches you how to worship. Third, it teaches you how to walk in the common marketplace of life. And fourth, it teaches you how to wait on the Master. Lord, give me hope and give me faith. Father, I pray as we partake of communion tonight, with this psalm in mind, that we might bow our hearts before the King of Kings. And God, we ask for hope. We ask for hope for our nation. We ask hope for the things that are coming our way. And God, would you teach us that really discouragement is really your opportunities in our life. And sometimes discouragement becomes your appointed times for us. So I guess what I'm saying is that 
no matter what we go through, it's your perfect will that we would come out shining every single time. No chastising for the time seems joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, it brings forth the fruit of righteousness. And so, God, as we walk to the table, tonight would this table be a table of hope? Would you give your people hope? And would they understand the God that they have inside of them? Would they praise Him? Would they worship Him? And would they honor Him tonight in all they do as you teach us to consecrate our life unto you? In Jesus' name, amen.